Well, good morning and welcome back to another look at some lessons from Scripture. This is October 3rd. This is Saturday, so I hope to get this to you real soon. So the question lately has come up all over the place. Why go to church? So we've got this to go to church, not to go to church. What is the issue here? Well, personally, I feel it's time to come back. It definitely is time to come back. Now, with all of this coronavirus talk going on, what is the true impact of it? Well, um, there are many questions there. But unfortunately, as Christians, we should look at these things in a different light. Um, I've seen basically across the board a lot of people going the way of the world, responding in fear, which you could break down as false evidence appearing real. But when we do that, we disregard something specific. Second Timothy 1 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We need to reactivate our sound minds. The power given to us from God and the love that through the centuries, Christians have responded during epidemics it, with mercy and love to everyone around them. Look at our hospitals today. How did they get started? Well, it was churches. It was Christians that started the first hospitals. So if there's anything that the coronavirus pandemic has taught us, it is that gathering with believers is essential. It definitely is. Excuse me while I get some heat on my throat. So the church is essential. Why? Well, it's essential for society. It's essential for the church's health. And most importantly, it is essential for my soul's health and for yours. Now, Hebrews 10 has always been the go-to passage when it comes to church attendance. And while we love to tell the guy who skips church in order to watch football to not neglect the gathering, I wonder if we ever considered this question. Why were the early saints tempted to skip church? Were they going to watch the local Olympics? Well, I mean, some of them had seen the resurrected Jesus. If they hadn't, most had met someone who had. So here's those two verses. Like I said, are the go-to verses. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we need to look at context here. While it is surprising to hear of the Hebrew struggle, those initial Jewish believers who became Christians, I think we can find the answer in the very context of the passage itself. Now let's look at the next two verses. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. 
So, after declaring the priority of the gathering and admonishing the church to stop skipping, the writer of Hebrews goes on to explain his concern for those who sin willfully. And in this context, those who sin willfully, by what? Refusing to attend church. And then the next two verses. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So here the writer is hearkening back to these Jews. They know this about Moses' law. And from the book of Leviticus, the testimony of two or three witnesses. So he's hearkening back to them to recall their upbringing in the Mosaic law. And then he goes on. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. So there's the comparison between the law of, Mo law of Moses and the blood of the Son of God. Then he adds, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Here's a verse you hear quoted all the time. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, we tend to apply that to all kinds of things, which is appropriate. But here, it's specifically applied about attending the gathering believers. So he says that those who make it a habit of sinning should be worried about the fate of their soul. Hmm, not going to church, a habit of sinning. If you know something is sin and have no problem doing it, then the writer of Hebrews says you should be concerned. But then he says something pretty fascinating. He reminds them about what they faced when they gathered together at church in the past. The persecution they endured is far greater than missing out on a football game or at the day of a or a day at the lake house or fishing or whatever, their troubles were serious. Okay, 32 through 36. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering. Just a note here that word enlightened is, is actually talking about their receiving of the Holy Spirit that all Christians receive upon salvation. So they were enlightened by the Spirit. Then he said, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Oh boy, that would be a hard one for us in America to take. Since you knew that you yourself had a better possession and an abiding one. There it is. Suffering in the present, looking to the future glory. Then he ends it. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So there, our confidence, don't throw it away, which has a great reward. We will be rewarded on how we respond, how we act, what we do. So with that scene, that's a whole new ball game. When going to church might result in losing your home, being beaten or even killed, and yet astonishingly, the, the writer of Hebrews looks them straight in the eye, so to speak, and tells them that if they have to choose between their life and going to church, what do they choose? 
They choose going to church every single time. This would definitely weed out the tares from the wheat. So, church closings. All these church closures has been an opportunity for us to consider just how essential the church is. I'm not talking about essential in a political kind of way or even a societal one. I'm talking about how essential it is to you and me as Christians. Very essential. So instead of when we are not going to church, it seems we have a much easier time of falling into various trials and even becoming so much more like the world. This is where the problem creeps in. That puts us immediately in a danger zone. There seems to be one main problem we revert to because of our fallen nature. Now earlier I reminded you of fear, but this is something a little different. What would that be, you may ask? Well, quite simply, panic and anxiety. This is what the entire world has done. Anxiety could be defined as the state of feeling nervous or worried that something bad is going to happen. And that's from the Oxford Dictionary. Oftentimes, it can start with a slow train wreck in the mind. One thought begins to crash after another and another and another, and then it feels impossible to control as frightening and unsettling thoughts begin to compound like that derail, derailed train wreck. It keeps going and crashing, and it feels like you can do nothing. This way of thinking, what does it result in? What ifs? That's what we start doing. Well, what if this? What if that? What if I didn't do this? What if I did this? How much toilet paper do I have? On and on and on. And what am I going to do? There can be very unpleasant, these can be very unpleasant experiences. It seems like all is lost. Nothing is going to work out. That you could be in this dark pit of torment forever. This can be an absolutely horrendous experience. And I think we've been seeing ourselves and people around us fall into this. And it also spurs then a loneliness, which is turning out to be at epidemic portions in our culture. And it can also, for Christians, reveal shame. So if you are a believer in Christ, it can be embarrassing to experience anxiety for many reasons. First, you know biblical truth, which should give an unshakable peace. And then this compounds the frustration and anxiety. Now this is where our compassions as brothers and sisters of Christ come in. So then that just spurs all these symptoms, physical, psychological, and even behavioral. And to make things worth, worse, we can be anxious about being anxious. Experiences of anxiety can be so distressing that one can grow anxious as they wonder if another bout of anxiety is coming. You might say stuff like, is tonight going to be another sleepless night? Will I be able to function tomorrow? And it just keeps rolling, just like that. And oftentimes we don't connect the physical problems that occur from this anxiety. You know, pounding heart, dizziness, headaches, dry mouth, stomach pains, nausea, diarrhea. That all happens and there's documented proof that these symptoms of anxiety cause this stuff. And we all turn into some kind of anxiety superhero, like anxiety girl here, able to jump to the worst conclusion in a single bound. So that brings up the question, 
Is it a sin to be anxious? Hmm. We need to think about that one. Well, Jesus talking here in Matthew 6, 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What's the key word there that Jesus brings up? Do not. So then, just from that simple instruction, it seems to me, yes, that's a yes. Sin is anxiety, and anxiety is sin. Well, here's more. Matthew 6, 31 and 32. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. There's the key right there, the, the pagans. And that's just simply the world. So he's making a comparison here. Don't be like the world. Don't respond like the world. And then, of course, we remember the words of Paul, do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So there is another do not. Don't do it, he's saying. This is where we must begin in dealing with anxiety. Anxiety is sin. The symptoms and associated difficulties are not necessarily sinful, but the act of anxiousness is. And you can pair that with fear and with worry. It all kind of falls into the same boat. Anxiety then is sin for several different reasons. It actually is kind of like idolatry, and that means to worship, worship something which should never be worshipped, something other than the true God. Sometimes the reason we worry is because we are worshipping health and feeling good, and I see that all around us today. If something comes along that threatens it, I will worry. Maybe I worship my financial security. If somebody, if something threatens that, I will grow anxious. Finances and health in themselves are good things, but they are not to be God things. We are not to love, we are to love the Lord our God, not feeling good and finances. And in essence, feelings then have nothing to do with our status. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's what we should be doing loving God, honoring God. If there's any fear, it's a fear of God. Then there's pride. Oh my. In that moment, we might have a wrong or low view of God and a high view of self. And that happens all the time. I can solve my own problem. We might be failing to think that God is not an all good, all knowing, all perfect, and all providing father or we can suppose that we have more control than God has allotted. Worry worries at times because it cannot control the uncontrollable. And with that in mind, we need to remember we really don't control anything. As Proverbs 16.5 states, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. And then there's the lack of thankfulness. Worry is dealt with in part by thankfulness. So where there is worry, there may be a lack of gratitude and we are to give thanks in all things. As 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 
And then there is self-centeredness, and oh, does that come cascading down. So when we are consumed by worry, we often become self-focused and self-consumed. We are spending too much time thinking about ourselves, what we want, instead of thinking about loving others, praying, and the key, obedience to God. So hope is what we need and it changes everything. Anxiety is a sin does not give us less hope, but more. Well, you might think that doesn't make sense, why? Well, because Jesus came to die for sin and do away with its power in our lives. If something is sin, there is hope. Christ paid the penalty for it. And all you do is go back to John 16 again, the words of Jesus. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There's hope right there. And then Psalm 62, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. We need to in essence, house ourselves in the right spot. We need to remember that the everlasting arms are underneath us and his protection is always over us. And then 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. And then Matthew 11, come to me, all you, you who are weary and burdened, boy, is that the case now? And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then Romans 8, 1. Here's what we can hang it all on. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then Paul reminds us in Philippians 1, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now see that falls back to that verse 25 in Hebrews 10 talking about the coming of our Lord. Well, Paul agrees with that. He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So note this well, the Bible is a powerful and sufficient tool for anxiety. Read it, memorize it, pray it. That's what God has given us to work with. And it results in unselfishness. It turns our thinking around to, how will this affect the other person? Is this self-serving or to serve others? It helps us to question ourselves. We gain in direct proportion to the real help we give others. And that is so true. So we need to keep fighting the good fight. If we are anxious, we need to fight. And the great news for those who struggle with these fears and anxiety is that God has equipped us with tools to fight it. It can seem very difficult to impossible in anxiety to get motivated to fight, but we can and we must. And God gives us the strength to take up his resources. Now, this brings me to Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, have you, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, here it is, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So for many, the motivation to fight can diminish. It's difficult. Anxiety keeps coming. And then you get to this, what's the point? Well, the point is that God has promised to transform us 
he absolutely guarantees that we will be changed. That may not mean that he changes us at the rate we want. We need to remember that. Notice these words here. As we fight, God is also at work. That's where it says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But then it reminds us, for it is God who works in you. That is great news. He promises to be at work. We should not think about it about it if anxiety will still be around in a month or a year from now. Look to God today. Praise him when you make it through another day. Keep fighting. He is at work. As Jeremiah said, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So we should know from all this that God's grace is sufficient. And that does not mean that God will remove the distress right away. We need to remember that. Instead, he will strengthen us to keep going. That does not mean we will keep going feeling great. You know, that's that phrase you hear from a lot of people. Well, I had a peace about it. Well, there again, you're depending on feelings. Uh, we, don't, we aren't promised that we will feel great. We aren't promised that we will be at peace. That's basically we're being idolatrous there. It's our peace we're looking at. No, we need the peace of God, the peace that passes understanding. So at times it can be quite the opposite. So what this means is that his grace is sufficient, is in part that he will not fail to be with us in it. He will not abandon us. He will not let us fall away from Christ. Remember Jesus said, all the Father has given me, I have kept. He will strengthen us in our weakness, though we will not feel strong. We're not guaranteed that feeling. We will feel weak. Well, in 2 Corinthians, Paul said in chapter 3, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. There's another word for it, sufficiency. We need to put it all in God, not in our own self-sufficiency. And so remember then later in 2 Corinthians, Paul goes through this whole thing of dealing with the thorn in your flesh. We all have them. We all have to deal with it. So there's that thorn, that devilish messenger, whatever it was, it was seemingly unbearable to Paul. It was more important that Paul experienced the Lord's sufficient grace to keep going than it was to remove it and give quick relief. And I think that's a problem that has developed in America today. Everything is quick. We want it now. And that has seeped into the church. We look for quick relief. So let us pray and fight to rest in our weakness. And let us fight to put our minds on our good God who never ever abandons us in these trials. Indeed, God's grace is sufficient in our distress. So obviously, it is better to skip church if by going you will threaten the health of others around you, or if you can't even stand up and walk, or if you have to remain. I mean, we know that. We know if you're under extreme medical care, you can't go. Stay home if you're sick. But I think that all Christians can, or better yet, should agree with the sentiment expressed by D.L. Moody when he said, Church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood to a sick man. Now that's a good analogy there. To really be covered by the blood of Christ, we need that community. We need that teaching. We need those in charge over us to teach. We need to learn. That's the blood of Christ. 
just like a transfusion can help heal a very sick person. So without public worship, it is impossible to do the commands of Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25. Remember that way back earlier in this lesson? We're called to stir up, to meet up, and to fire up. And all that simply means is encourage one another. We are to be stimulating or to put it in a more important term, we are even to be inciting each other to do something, anything for the advancement of the kingdom. So the invitation is to be responded to individually, but in the corporate setting. This takes the form of comfort. This is when we can truly experience that comfort is among our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then there's a warning in all of this. There is an eschatological urgency to this encouragement as the strength, as the coming of Christ approaches. So this warning is actually strengthening. And it actually is talking about apostasy. This warning is one of the most serious warnings in scripture. Remember those verses <clears throat> we went through after 24 and 25, the rest of it is basically talking about apostasy. The falling away would be those who were not believers in the first place. So this is a wake up call to believers and to basically root out the tares that are among the wheat. Earlier in the book of Hebrews, the writer said, be encouraged one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So, so this reacting with anxiety, fear, um, and worry is actually deceitfulness and it hardens our hearts. And then in 2 Corinthians again, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, see Paul's calling it light and momentary, which it is comparatively. <clears throat> and what is that doing? It is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. <clears throat> As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We've got to get our vision corrected. We need to look at the eternal and not at all this stuff that's around us. So yes, indeed, we do need to practice social distancing, but between the church and state. I know that there's a lot of debates right now about churches and their submission to government, orders and regarding whether meeting is essential or not. But can we simply put those arguments aside and agree with this simple point that it is better to die than to skip church? That's what the writer of Hebrews was saying. <clears throat> Philippians 1.23 I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ which is better by far. There it is right there. So I'm not trying to fix any problems or win a debate. I am simply reminding all of us that as the Lord tarries, that we are called to do two things, just two, to evangelize the unsaved and to encourage the saved. And in doing all that, we give him glory. And if either of these things are taken away from us, then we might as well go to heaven, for it is far better to be with Christ.
As Psalm 34, 18 and 19 states, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. There, there's our assurance. And saves those who have a crushed spirit. That's anxiety actually in the Hebrew. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And as I said earlier, that not, might not be right now, but we know for sure it will happen at his appearing. So he reigns, he's risen, he looks upon us with compassion and mercy. So then let all of us who are under the crushing weight of anxiety and other distress look up to Christ. Let us trust in him for forgiveness and change, and let us press on looking to the hope of heaven, where all things will be made new. We will have our new bodies. We will be in a perfect condition. That's our joy and what we look forward to. So this is the communion of the saints. We need each other. So next week, that's October 11th, let us see each other in Sunday school and at church. Same time, same place. Amen. And let that be our prayer. Holy God, bring us together as the saints need to be as you will do in your glorious appearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, until next time, goodbye.